Hi, good, uh, good morning everyone. We have uh, today with us uh, Vineet Rai, who is the MD and founder of Avishkar Group, one of the most uh, the pioneers in impact investing in India. Uh, we'll just go straight away, start into the uh, discussion, uh, straight into discussion, and we'll probably uh, can take any questions we can. Uh, so I'm, I'm asking, you know, I'm adding him to the loop. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, how is the, with the lockdown? It's, uh, sometimes it's difficult to get uh, time when you are actually on the road and you're quite busy. Uh, so I'm very glad that you could join us. And uh, as mentioned to you during our introduction, I personally have been following your work for the last 10 years and some of the most very exciting stuff that you do in the investment space. Uh, I'm very really honored that you could join us. And uh, yeah, uh, welcome to our discussion. And basically, uh, a very friendly conversation between you and I. And you know, we're just getting everybody to understand what we're talking about and you know, uh, in a bit more detail. So welcome. So, namaste to everyone. In the COVID times, that's probably the best way to actually engage with each other. And uh, thank you for having me with you. Yeah. So, I would uh, uh, start, we need with one basic question. Uh, it's basically uh, impact investment is still a very fuzzy word for, for many people. Uh, so, just from your perspective, what what is impact investment about? And uh, what is the uh, what are the uh, some of the myths around it? And uh, what are the kind of developmental goals that you have in addition to profit? If you could just give some introduction, that'd be great. And so I, I think, uh, so first and foremost, let's start with that every business makes impact. So whatever you do makes impact. So, uh, so impact is not a prerogative of only impact investors. Uh, if you look at the Indian uh, corporate law, it actually talks about shareholders and stakeholders not just shareholders. So uh, I think uh, the act of responsibility, being responsible towards uh, towards shareholders, towards your employees, towards your customers, and at, at, at the extreme end, to be conscious towards the society is all constitutes uh, what we do, what we claim businesses. Of course, there are very greedy business who will only focus on the shareholders return. Uh, but in general, all businesses in one way or the other actually make impact. So then the big question is, so what is impact investment if everybody makes impact? I think impact investors is the next step or it's actually a committed step from those who have capital to claim that when I will make an investment, I will go beyond the ordinary call of starting a business, which is conscious and responsible towards the society. Uh, but we will hold ourselves accountable and we will report uh, what we do. Now, the most important thing is not reporting because reporting you can do at a fairly insignificant cost to the business. But uh, identifying how you are different, then trying to scale yourself up and then making a and then actually holding yourself accountable to the dire goal. So, for example, Avishkar tries to make investments in low income states. We go in early. We work with the people who are operating in businesses and sectors that are not the most exciting ones. Uh, uh, in that sense, when I say exciting ones, they are not really trendy in Silicon Valley. They are not trendy in the Silicon Valley of India, Bangalore. Uh, but they are ones that actually create real jobs, real people. Uh, so it could be farmers, it could be rack pickers, it could be microfinance institutions. Anybody and everybody who actually does not look like a client, uh, but is potentially a client, has been excluded from the economic activity, becomes an important parameter for us to bring them into the economic activity, treat them as our customers, respect them like we would like to be respected. Uh, and the ultimate panacea uh, that impact investing can offer is if you can make them rich, which is they become the owner of the businesses that you're creating. Not that we have all been very successful in doing the last part, but uh, we have done a reasonable uh, amount of success in other areas. One very basic question as a layman. Let's assume that uh, 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 someone who produces vaccines in India, right, and possibly manufacture of the cheapest vaccines in India, uh, but definitely have an impact on uh, a lot of child children around the world, uh, but still runs on a very high profit margin. Would you consider such a company uh, in your bracket of impact investment? So I think there is a myth we have created uh, in our minds. So the first myth is uh, 
if you are actually producing a vaccine and selling it at no for profit no loss basis then you are a philanthropist and let's be very clear philanthropy is very different from impact investing uh, if you are an impact investor then you are actually trying to create a vaccine which is so affordable that everybody can use it and in the process if you are able to generate returns that we do not seek any limits on the returns however because you are trying to actually create a beneficial relationship between you and the customer uh, there are natural hedges that you will build in so for example in telecom or in any business at some point of time if you are making a 90% return uh, do you what does it say it says that you have a huge capability to drop the price further so we would encourage as investors for people to come into the realms of what is uh, realistic and not move towards the realm of what is usurious so uh, profit at all cost and it can happen actually if you are in a thin margin business also you can try to cut corners in order to increase your this thing we believe whatever profit you can make while doing a responsible business being respectful to your client and customer and doing it in a targeted manner is impact investing we do not talk about returns because this is a probability uh, you can have zero returns uh, i mean i have had a lot of write offs uh, and you can actually have high returns as well ultimately as an impact investor most of us struggle to even reach 15% uh, roi uh, I, frankly 15% would people will be delighted uh, everybody aspires to be a 20% return on uh, return on investments uh, on a on a irr basis but a 20% irr is a very rare achievement even in the mainstream world so if a impact fund does it it is not because it is not trying to make impact it must have done it because it went into a space like it happened in microfinance initially if you went in microfinance not knowing how large it can become just to give you an idea when i started investing in microfinance the entire microfinance sector was less than 150 crores just to give you an idea today the entire exposure of the banking sector to microfinance to mfis and small finance bank and big banks is 3 lakh crores now 100 crore to 3 lakh crores is an astronomical jump in 20 years uh, none of us predicted it so if you made the returns because the sector grew so much uh, then it's great but uh, it ha happens once in a while and never happens uh, so we have lost money in agriculture we have lost money in water sanitation health uh, maybe you made money somewhere else but uh, in general the expectation is try to make money uh, be very responsible be very conscious and be very aware of who you are working it because we work with very vulnerable sections of the society as customers uh, we have to take extra responsibility and extra care yeah. one one more question in that segment uh, so whenever you know, we speak to dfi they have the esg goals and things like that from your or avishkar's perspective right do you have any particular uh, section of esg that you focus on uh, in terms of you know measuring the impact so again let's actually let's actually be very clear again there is a lot of lack of understanding so esg is a framework okay you are doing a business and then you apply a framework to that business so it's sort of a guide that in the environment i can't do this in social social areas i will not do this in governance i'll follow this norm impact investing is a strategy there is a huge difference between a framework and a strategy framework is you are checking yourself Uh, am i actually following these right so it's an organized framework that you are checking against impact investing is a conscious proactive so if you if you play cricket that's a front foot shot that's impact investing esg is trying to be copy book elbow should not go here this now you cannot actually look at a copy book and try to play brightly so impact investing is you are told okay when the ball comes i will do this that's what impact investing is you clearly define it you come forward you make that statement and you say i will hold myself accountable and responsible for what i am going to do uh, esg is a framework in which i can tell my investors okay guys if you want to know this is my strategy but if i put it in this framework this is how my outcomes look that's really cool. very uh, clear way of uh, uh, not teaching us what what it is about and It's really cool. See the interviews that uh, in where, where you said that uh, nobody can come and tell me that I can't do something. I always uh, uh, 
do not take uh, uh, everybody say like I mean, it's, it's not possible to do something and you always run so many seemingly impossible things right from your uh, when you started all this so what was your journey how did it all began you were so you you you, you were really spoken about in international community about 10 years and i've heard it myself personally how did you how did you see that what is your story See, I think uh, that statement was actually has been it sounds I am very pompous, but that's not what I was trying to say. I was saying that one of the attitudes one should carry is if somebody says this cannot be done, then there is actually a challenge for you to try it. So I am one of those. I come up with that philosophy. So when people say, "Okay, this cannot be done," then I see it as an invitation to walk that path. I'm not saying I will actually make it happen, but I like to walk on that path. So, yeah. so it's not to try to say that I will make impossible possible. But when you are trying to, actually, let's say, if there are ten things in front of you and people say these ten things cannot be done, and if I'm trying also ten things, at least one I should be able to do. So, so I've been lucky in that sense. Uh, my path is very simple. I'm a. I came from a classical middle class family. Uh, uh, was quite. Absolutely mediocre in all strengths uh, of the term mediocrity. Uh, five foot seven inch in height, average build, uh, average looks, uh, average work ethic, average uh, average educational capabilities. Uh, but I always wanted to excel. Uh, did not know where to excel, so I chose to. Uh, for example, I wanted to be the best footballer, but uh, I was not the best footballer. So. I was. Uh, I created two groups. One group was actually the friends, which were all uh, very good in education, and I was the best footballer among those who were best in education. And then I was the best. Uh, and then I had a group of footballers and cricket players. Uh, amongst them, I was best in uh, my uh, my education. So, so, and uh, I think uh, 20 years, 25, 30 years later, I realized that uh, that's what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is a mediocre person with a desire to with a very good understanding of his or her limitations and then making the most out of it by defining and looking at the parameters around. So if you can make the most within your limitations, then you become an excellent entrepreneur. And so therefore, probably I became an entrepreneur. What is the size of Avishkar now? I think it's around 8,000 or What is the... Yeah, so, so see again, uh, Avishkar now is no more an impact mister. We have morphed into an impact platform. Uh, and when I say a platform, we are not just somebody who give money to other entrepreneurs. Uh, we are also entrepreneurs ourselves. So when I started off, I had no money and I had this idea of taking money for rural India. Uh, and I realized that just giving money to poor people or rural people is not going to change the reality. So you need to take talent also. So money and talent, I wanted to take that to rural India. And I therefore, uh, I started with no money or really 5,000 rupees and 1 lakh rupees that I borrowed. But around 2010, I actually started realizing that uh, the demand of capital is of very different kinds. Uh, there is debt, debt, microfinance, debt, equity and advisory. Uh, and uh, within the ability of providing debt, you can use technology as well. So, so in 2016, uh, and so because I'm always excited, I actually started something or the other. We bought a microfinance company called Arohan in 2012. We started Intelligro in 2011 and then we launched Tribe in 2012, uh, 2015 actually. And then what we did in 2016, we morphed into a platform uh, and uh, now it is called the Avishkar Group. And so Avishkar Group roughly manages at this point of time 8,000 crores. We hopefully are, uh, and our target is to by 2025 reach 7, 8 billion and uh, hopefully by 2030 actually go much further. Uh, given that we are in a decadal phase 2020 and going to 2030, uh, I think uh, 2030 may be a more logical target. It's also a target that sustainable development goals have also defined, so we align with that. Uh, and hopefully our idea is that whatever we have done in India, which is right from microfinance, uh, uh, individual lending, SME lending, angel network, uh, venture capital uh, or impact investing, Sankalp, which is a convening platform in IntelliCap, which is an ecosystem builder. Whatever we have done in India, we replicated in Southeast Asia and South Asia and also in East and West Africa. Uh, we went to Africa, uh, uh, Africa and Southeast Asia around five, six years back. And we have been there now for six to seven years. So 
we have a reasonable presence uh, in both these continents and so we are trying to become a south south platform of impact platform uh, managing roughly 1.2 billion dollars or 1.1 billion dollars because of the rupee exchange rate keeps changing uh, the numbers also keep moving but uh, 1.15 billion dollar might be actually a more accurate uh, number at this point of time uh, hoping to go to between to 10 10 billion dollar over next 7 7 8 years well, just two questions uh, from there the first question is how are indian entrepreneurs or particularly indian multinationals how are they looking at uh let's say becoming lp to a, a fund which also has uh, uh other non not profit goals as well how, how are they looking at it are there interest interest uh, increased interest so uh, so let me put it this way that uh, indian indian investors uh, were not very interested uh, because they had these notions that if you are looking at doing an impact investing then it is necessary against returns that means you will not make returns or you will make less returns uh, that they it was difficult for us to explain and for them to accept that uh, returns are improbability we don't know what we can say is we will use we will use the strategy and we'll strive for this return Uh, and what will happen we don't know it will happen 10 years later and i mean who predicted covid who predicted demonetization things have external things have happened and very few funds have also levered returns uh, which are very high uh, when you go to people and say hey i am going to work with poor people the necessary corollary of that is oh you will not make money uh, my general belief from my forest days and i am a forester by training is i used to work with 2500 odd laborers directly working with me in the forest and not a single poor person i met ever wanted to be poor so so the highest hunger to be actually rich is with the poorest people and if if i am going to work with them it is impossible for me to actually not make money while they all want to make money in fact why would a poor look up to me if i want to be poor uh, that was my big question and, and so I am a complete antithesis of romanticizing poverty. I don't believe poor are different from rich. Poor exactly behave the same way because their contexts are different, their risks are different. Certain behaviors may ha- happen differently, but at the end of it, we are all human beings. Uh, and rich and poor is no classification. It's a classification done by rich to actually segregate themselves from the poor. But if you take off uh, the sheen from the rich, they all look and feel and talk like poor. So, so I don't think so. You can look at poor and say that poor want to remain poor. I actually want to be rich. Poor want to be rich. I want to participate in that empathetic uh, process of converting rich poor into rich. Uh, and this, it's not necessary by making rich poor. So, so a lot of people think that I'll become rich, then I'll do philanthropy, and uh, in the process, I'll make poor rich. that in my view is actually not the most intelligent way of doing it philanthropy has been trying for a long time and the reason we came up with the idea of impact investing some of us was because we believe that uh, you becoming rich and then trying to help poor people come up is not really the smartest way you have to become rich while you make poor rich and that's what impact investing is now the, what about the interest are there interest because uh, I, i know so we do there, there is so i'll give you just factual information uh, no indian ever invested uh, i mean most indians who invested in us were actually largely even us 2000 1000 5000 dollars uh, largely non indian non resident indians uh, then uh, in 2017 2016 2016 17 i for the first time in my life uh, decided to make a real pitch to the indians and to my surprise uh, our fifth fund which is a 115 million dollar fund is 50% indian Uh, indian institutions indian indian corporates indian individuals uh, and uh, uh, it is far more easier to convince an indian to give you a half a million dollar today than it is to an american or a european to give half a million dollar so uh, uh, it also uh, let me also give credit to narendra modi and the bjp government for starting the 10000 crore startup fund so we also got a participation from small industries development bank of india we got a participation from nabard uh, we got a for participation from uh, mr smil gunjal who uh, unlike many other rich people was uh, brave enough to not offer me a significant investment but also double the amount actually i asked him half the amount he said i'll give it to you and then uh, to his great credibility he came back to me and said hey uh, do you mind if i double it i mean it's never happened in my history people always half it uh, but so 
uh, incredible confidence shown by Mr. Sunil Bunjal in uh, uh, probably less in my ability, but more in the ability of the people we are working with. I think he he he, he resonated with the idea that poor can actually be made rich. So, uh, and then there are lots of other uh, Indians who we don't know as well as we know Mr. Munjal, who also decided to participate, giving us three crores, five crores, ten crores, two crores, uh, which is quite am uh, amazing. So, I, I never thought you will be able to raise from Indians uh, as large as sixty million dollars, but uh, we did manage to raise it. Actually, I just want to add one point here. So, we do something called the foreign philanthropists. It's basically do research on the Indian philanthropy and CSR landscape. And uh, I know that one of the top 10 in the philanthropy list was very serious about creating an impact fund. But they just don't know how to go about it and you know create something like that. So there is a significant you know, uh, 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 shift from just philanthropy to impact. Uh, I would be I would be happy to meet them in case you, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you in case you meet them next time you can introduce. But again, I'll I'll be very very candid. I believe philanthropy is very important. Uh, as you can see, post COVID nineteen, the challenges that we have seen, even Avishkar, which has actually stayed away from philanthropy, and I personally who have stayed away from philanthropy, uh, our foundation, Avishkar Foundation, and all of us gathered around two crores to actually help uh, those in not for profits who are working with migrant laborers and feeding them. Uh, we also actually adopted seven uh, districts uh, in India to provide PPE kits to the government hospitals. Uh, but uh, so therefore, I would under no circumstances say that impact investing is uh, 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 complete, should replace philanthropy. I believe philanthropy should continue and most of the money that is going in philanthropy must go. Impact investing responsibility is to pull away the $200 trillion that is in commercial capital and make the commercial capital be aware that there is a better way of building the society, a more sustainable and a better way to build the society. And that is what impact investing is. And probably you will make similar kind of returns, but you will have a much better and more fruitful uh, engagement with the society. Sure. Uh, uh, one question is, uh, of course, one of the LPCD team, uh, their priority is to look at those kind of countries which are not uh, attractive enough from an investment perspective, and their objective is to try and make returns from those countries. Right? So, from an impact perspective, my question to you is: uh, What COVID has shown to us is that most of the so-called developed nations are not really strong when it comes to human development. Yeah, uh, uh, that's why the where the, the debt and <laughs> that's it's very visible. So now, uh, would such markets appeal to you if an opportunity? From a so-called development developed nation company, which which has some relationship. Uh, so see, uh, I think uh, uh, it's all a power of narrative. So the developed world actually knows how to write narratives, uh, and their narratives is always self-centered. Uh, oh, we understand how to do business, and we'll teach uh, these developing and least developed countries and how to do business. Uh, I don't think so. Anybody is teaching anybody. It's just a circle of uh, progress. Somebody has reached there earlier, but it's not that these countries are not poor or suffering from plague. I mean, you can just go back 200 years before industrial revolution, 300 years back. The rich countries were quite poor themselves. So, uh, and some of the poor, richest countries of the past, China and India, are quite poor now. So, it's, it's just a cycle of uh, progress and growth. Uh, I think uh, there is a significant amount of impact investing that is taking place in Europe and US already. Uh, I mean, if you just think about uh, US and you go to San Francisco today, the number of people walking in the streets without having a home is just mind boggling. Uh, you go to poorer, uh, poorer states uh, within the uh, United States. You would actually see a fairly significant uh, history of children who have never lived in a home. They have been born and brought up and brought up in a pickup truck. So, so this kind of challenges that uh, all countries, which are actually much much richer than us, uh, this inequity that exists between uh, have and have nots, uh, actually exist as much in US as it exists in India and probably in Africa. Uh, impact investing is a strategy which is not really about developed countries. Is a strategy that is applicable in any unequal society, uh, and its job is to make societies more equal. Okay. Uh, one question from one of the viewers is: uh, I'll probably put the question on the board here. Uh, it's a generic, more of a generic question, but he would like to know uh, how the COVID nineteen recovery looked like. Is it V shaped, slower, U shaped, 
a it's a pretty common yeah. <laughs> discussion. Yeah, well, if, if, yeah. if, if, if I knew the answer, then I would actually be getting a Nobel Prize. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know the answer. Uh, you and I are in the same boat, uh, probably uh, facing a different challenge, but uh, we are all in the same boat. And anybody who will tell you that they know it uh, is basically just lying. So don't believe anybody. We'll have to go through this. Uh, I can assure you that uh, nobody knows. Uh, just be very aware that nobody knows. And if you want to be assured, uh, then whatever the three you want to pick, you pick. I'll agree with you. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and has your priorities changed before COVID, post COVID, and uh, invest investment thesis? See, see, I am an entrepreneur as well. As I told you, I have seven thousand employees. Uh, we have to pay out. Uh, 50s of crores of monthly salary. So uh, I struggled and I was as fearful as anybody else, as anxious as anybody else. But I have also gone through many cycles of high risk behavior. So just because there is actually an impossible wave in front of you that is high and mighty and that you can't see beyond it, doesn't mean that my job of thinking should reduce. So I landed in India on 12th of 12th night, 12th March night. Uh, I had I was in Europe, so I had already seen what was going on. Uh, I I personally felt that India by locking its border, closing down the borders, made a huge difference. Uh, but instead of actually uh, worrying about what will happen, we started acting, and we started acting on March 12th itself. So. Uh, uh, I lost $275 million of capital that we were raising, which we were on the signing stage because of COVID-19. And we were just trying to figure out, hey, well, what is COVID-19? And the investor said, hey, there is too much uh, global fear. So they walked away. And we started actually accounting that the risks that we had conceptualized and the risks that we are going to face are going to be of a completely different magnitude. So how do you prepare yourself to deal with this high risk behavior uh, that we are going to see across the board? Uh, the first thing is if you have to cut cost, I actually sent out a video to my own colleagues, uh, other CEOs uh, of the companies that we have invested in, 40, 50 CEOs, that don't try to cut costs by firing people because they will not get a job. Is there a way that we can actually uh, cut costs across the board so that if you want to reduce 30% of your cost bill, it comes from top to bottom and it doesn't come from few people. Let us share the pain and not just pass on the pain. Uh, we actually spoke to everybody uh, multiple times, all our LPs, all our board members, all of this thing. I think simple rules of this game is over communicate, talk to everybody, both to the employees, to the assure everybody, uh, at least let them know how you are feeling. Uh, if you are anxious, tell them you are anxious. If they are anxious, tell them uh, it's natural to be anxious in such times. Uh, be transparent, be human. Uh, if you are fearful, share it, uh, co-opt your folks into your fear and then you will suddenly realize that uh, when you are not alone and you are in a combined form, uh, you have the courage to take more decisions uh, than you would be as an individual. So I've always believed in actually sharing very transparently and uh, I would recommend to everybody to share transparently. Of course, uh, you have to rethink, rethought. I went to the same investors. I told them a new story. At post COVID 19, and as I said, you have to be on the front foot. So I converted, I look at crisis as an opportunity. Because on one side, it's just causing destruction. On the other side, it is opening new doors that you probably are not seeing. But in the post, once the dust settles, you will see those doors. If you can see them before the dust settles, probably it'll give you an uh, opportunity to do things that you thought can never be done. And comes back to your opening question uh, it's not that I want to do those things. Unfortunately, when pushed into a corner, when you can't see a path forward, you ask yourself, what is it that I can do, which looks impossible at this point of time. Uh, and that gives you ideas, which makes you do things that people think cannot be done. That's a really great insight. I think, uh, 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 do you have, I'm sure you, you've already given uh, your advice to your last uh, response. Do you have anything further to tell to the viewer? Uh, in terms of you know, dealing with the situation and do uh, uh, you have any generic advice to them? So my general advice to people is be listen to your instinct. Uh, if you feel that you are in serious trouble, uh, accept it. Uh, most people do not accept and they think that being bullheaded is a solution. Uh, if you try to break a brick wall with your head, uh, the wall will not break but your head will. So the best thing to do is if you face a brick wall, 
try to find a way around the wall rather than trying to break through it. Uh, in a situation where you don't know a solution, first accept that you don't know the solution. Once you accept it, suddenly you'll start realizing that uh, you will be far more adaptable, flexible in looking and listening to other people and adopting it. So uh, don't be rigid, be flexible. Try to accept so that you can reduce your anxiety and then start thinking for the worst, but preparing, preparing for the worst, but imagine and think for the best as well. Uh, it's not necessary that you need to actually, if you think the worst, the worst will happen. But preparing for the worst always prepares, helps you to think for the best as well. So I know I mixed it a little bit, but uh, you get the gist. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I always say myself when I uh, set up uh, in India about 10, uh, 18, 19 years back, uh, uh, one of the best things for me is to have interactions with entrepreneurs yourself from the rich list and you know uh, and all the other entrepreneurs. And it's always been a private conversation. So whenever I do an interview and give it to my uh, 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 transcript interview, like this is like a private conversation. You're not asking any real meaningful questions. And for me, it's always a learning. Uh, so I always say whenever I sit an entrepreneur for half an hour to now, it's like going to an MBA class for about six months to one year. Uh, I just wanted everybody to get a gist of what you were saying. For everything that you say, if we can just follow it, that make a lot of difference in our uh, business. I really, I truly believe it. And uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Vinny. I look forward to spending time with you once the whole lockdown is over and possibly have a cup of coffee uh, and you know, see how we can work together on the whole impact uh, uh, impact investment team. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Uh, have a fantastic day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.